In this next episode of our Getting to Know Jesus series, we visit Capernaum, searching for the archaeological remains of the town where Jesus based his ministry. Northern Israel is breathtaking. I love exploring this area because almost everywhere I go here, I know I may very well be walking in the footsteps of Jesus because this is where he spent most of his time on earth. This is his homeland. And this is the best place to really get to know him better. The Bible tells us that although Jesus grew up in Nazareth, Around the age of 30, he left home and moved to the shores of the Sea of Galilee. There in a small town called Capernaum, he based his three years of ministry. So, one beautiful morning in Tiberias, I met up with Danny the Digger Herman and asked him to take me to Capernaum so we could explore its archeological remains and get to know Jesus and his new hometown a bit better. As we drove along, the fields were glowing with yellow mustard plants all around us. It is no wonder Jesus referred to this plant during his ministry. You know, just one tiny mustard seed can certainly spread far and wide. Well, Danny, we have been to Nazareth now where Jesus grew up, and today uh, we're visiting the other hometown of Jesus. Yes, it even says it here on the label, the town of Jesus. The town of Jesus. But now, it became his town after being rejected in his original hometown in Nazareth. Right, right. Okay, when he's about 30, he's baptized by John the Baptist, a voice is heard, the dove appears, he goes back to his hometown and preaches for the first time about his messianic message but they reject him. Mm -hmm. So what he does is what I like calling today in the modern world, a relocation. He moves from Nazareth to a small fishing village by the Sea of Galilee called Kfar Nahum, the right. village of Nahum or Capernaum. So the site is today a fascinating archeological site more than anything else. Right. It's not inhabited in our time. So the archeologists could pretty much dig wherever they wanted. Mm -hmm. And one striking building appeared by the first scholars working here, whose facade is now on display here at eye level. This was the front of a big, magnificent building made out of white limestone when the rest of the village is a black basil stone. Mm -hmm. But what is it? Okay, when you look at the details here, it could be anything, right? It could be a church, could be a pagan temple, but no. It's part of a synagogue. Right. But where is the evidence for the Jewish identity? See the capital here, Jeff? Ah, uh, yes. It's a Corinthian capital, but on top it's got... A menorah. A menorah. And on both sides, mm -hmm. it's got a shofar and an incense shovel representing the high holidays. Okay. The Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement. Right. And if you're still not convinced, and right next to it, they have here a pillar with an inscription. In Aramaic, the language of the Jews in antiquity, you want to guess what the contents is? What is the contents of 90% of ancient inscriptions in synagogue or churches for that matter? Thank you, Mr. Cohen, for your generous donation. Uh. <laughs> so this is no exception. It's, it's thanking a certain person called Khalfi for paying for this column in that synagogue. But this is not the building. This is just a display. The right. building is here. As we made our way to the synagogue, I really felt like I was walking the route Jesus would have taken every Sabbath when he was based in his new hometown. 
So this is the synagogue? Yes, and in retrospect, it is the biggest and most grand ancient synagogue ever found in the Holy Land. Wow. That is quite surprising, especially considering that Capernaum was really a small fishing village. Okay. Look, look at this grand entry and imagine all the imagery we saw before placed up above it. Yeah, beautiful. Okay, and look at the interior. Wow. What a magnificent building. It is spectacular. I wish the Catholics would uh, reconstruct the full height of all of the columns. This doesn't look like it's in the right proportion, but in the mm. back it shows it in the proper way. And you see there's a small doorway indicating there was a second floor. Right. This was a grand building Amazing. in white limestone, like glowing in this dark village. Yeah. Fantastic. Except that there's one problem. The dating. Exactly. It's uh -huh. not really from the time of Jesus. Right. They ripped through the floors uh, and, uh, in order to find dating material. Mm. And the latest coins there go back to the sixth century. Okay. Jesus is first century. That's right. You student, we have a problem. <laughs> okay, so it's, it's, it is a grand synagogue in Capernaum, but it is later to the time of Jesus. But where is the synagogue of the time of Jesus? Mm, maybe beneath it, okay? Right. Which is one of the reasons why they went underneath the floor and they found it. Actually okay. here, there's also a wall of an earlier phase and a parallel one in the back. Right. And they did find first century remains there, but only at one place they left it uncovered. Here oh, is yeah. a window to the first century. The only place that's visible today. The rest can only be seen in the archeological report. Right. But they did leave a very remarkable part. You see the, the wall made out of the black basil stone, basil stone rounded yeah. stones that were not even shaped. They're not connected by mortar. But there is a doorway there, and that dates to the first century. Jesus may have entered the synagogue right there. So the stone that's standing up? Yes, okay. it is, is one part, and there's another one. Here, let me okay. show it to you from this side. From this angle, it's more clear, right? Right, absolutely. And you just need to imagine Jesus entering the building. It was much more humble, local stone. Right. But it was a synagogue, like what we know today in Magdala, in Masada, first century kind of small, almost square structures. Mm -hmm. And he stood there and he preached and he spoke and he performed miracles. Here, and there's one story of uh, Jesus healing a demon possessed man right here in this synagogue. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And, and it, there's another story of healing the uh, servant of the Centurion. Uh, yes. And and speaking in this, I think it appears like five or six times mm -hmm. the synagogue of Capernaum. Yeah. And the fact that archaeology could detect detect it. Yeah. That's mind boggling. It is mind boggling. You can date it right until the first century. Yeah. And we're looking at we're looking at the stones now. It says in the text that when Jesus healed the demon possessed man, that that immediately he left the synagogue. And he went to the house of uh, the mother-in-law of, mother of, Peter. of Peter, Simon Yona. Is that nearby here somewhere? Uh, it has to be. If the Gospel of Mark tells us he immediately entered the house nearby, it implies it was nearby. And that explains why the Catholics who own this property to this day excavated in all directions, this way, that way. You see there? Yes. But where did they find the smoking gun? Where did they find A house it? with evidence that suggests this was the very house over there. Okay. Should Can we, we go see? Let's go and see it. All right. Don't go away. When we come back, the experts talk to us about Capernaum and why Jesus might have made it his hometown during his years of ministry. I was a pastor for over 20 years before I first went to Israel, only to realize that I was totally disconnected from the roots of my faith. Since then, I've been on a journey of discovery and my faith has come alive in ways I never could have imagined. I'm Jeff Uters, Executive Director of First Century Foundations, and I'm excited to invite you to explore the land of the Bible and to discover your part in a Bible story that isn't over yet. 
First Century Foundations exists to reconnect Christians to the foundations of Christianity. And we do this by creating Bible-based media focused on Israel, but we don't just reconnect you to Israel in the Bible. We help you participate in what God is doing in Israel today by connecting you to over 70 ministries in Israel who desperately need our support. Will you partner with us? Together, we'll explore Israel's biblical past while playing our role in Israel's bright future. The town of Capernaum is a fascinating place where so many Bible stories come to life. As we explored the site, I found myself wondering why Jesus would have based his ministry here. Some of the experts I talked to in Israel had fascinating insights to share. How Jesus chose Capernaum, we don't really have a clear answer. In the Gospel of Luke, he has already been rejected in Nazareth before he relocates from Nazareth to Capernaum. But Capernaum offers uh, easy access around the Sea of Galilee. And I think if we were to look at Matthew's gospel, there will be a ripple effect throughout the Galilee, not just for Jews, but for Gentiles, that a great light is going to shine. And Galilee is inhabited by both Gentiles and Jews. In fact, Sepphoris that we talk about is one of those places. Capernaum has a Roman garrison with a centurion there. And so we have both Gentiles and Jews living side by side and, uh, and cordial relationships among them. And it offers easy boat access to all the ports. The greater concentration of population in the Galilee was around the coast of the Sea of Galilee because of the fishing industry. And so to be there, you have the ability to reach many towns and villages with less travel than if you're far west in Nazareth, for example. One of the most interesting things that I have personally thought about in terms of Jesus and his ministry was how much of his ministry on earth in the first century was performed below sea level. Have you ever thought of that? The, uh, the Sea of Galilee is 500 feet below sea level. The Dead Sea is about 1,300 feet. Jesus was baptized on the Jordan River, down near the Dead Sea, more than a thousand feet below sea level. Much of his ministry centered around Capernaum and uh, the, all around uh, the, the Sea of Galilee, below sea level. What does that mean to us? Here's what it means to me. He was willing to go down to the level. You know, he came down from heaven. He came down and he was willing to go down to where we were, even below sea level, even to the lowest points on the physical earth. Capernaum, if we look at the excavations today, we can see that there are remains of a first century synagogue uh, in the town center, which is right on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. And so there's a large Jewish population of regular townsfolk. We know some of them quite well because Peter's family lives in Capernaum, including his mother-in-law, who lives at his house. Um, we realize they have a synagogue and that Jairus, for example, is one of the uh, synagogue leaders and a person of tremendous stature in this town. We encounter a Roman centurion who uh, comes to, to Jesus and asks for his servant to be healed and, and has such faith that all that Jesus has to do is to say, go your way, he's been healed. The miracle that Jesus performed in healing the servant of the centurion is one of my favorites. It, for me, foretells the whole message of the gospel. Let's put it in context. In Matthew chapter eight, the first miracle that Jesus performs is to a leper, a Jewish leper. Why do we know that the leper was Jewish? Because he told them, do as Moses commanded you and go to the priest and have your you know, cleansing uh, uh, certified. Then the second miracle, was the miracle of the servant of the centurion. And Jesus said about that, you have such faith, I haven't seen it in all of Israel. The centurion was obviously not Jewish. He was from Rome. Isn't it fascinating that Rome, that hated enemy of the Jewish people, 
brings forth a man who has such faith that he approaches Jesus and says, you don't even have to come. Don't even come. Just say the word and it will be done. This is a redemption of the Roman people in the eyes of God. There is a man who stands in faith, and now this people group that is so hated is used by Jesus as a portal, as a, as a proclamation. The gospel is going to spread to the whole world. When we think about the healing of Peter's mother-in-law, I think we really need to think about a day in a Shabbat in Capernaum, because this is a Shabbat story, and it gives us a picture of what life was like on Shabbat for Jesus and his followers. So they went that morning to the synagogue, and I think that he healed a man there in the synagogue, and it's lunchtime, they go back to Peter's house. Peter's house, where his mother-in-law shares the home with them, is also the place where Jesus and his disciples receive hospitality, and then they stay when they're in Capernaum, they're at Peter's house. So it becomes the, the epicenter of the Jesus uh, organization or the Jesus group in Capernaum. They have lunch. Well, they're going to have lunch, but oh no, his mother-in-law who is helping to provide the food and cook it and serve everyone is not well. And so Jesus' priority is first to take care of the mother-in-law. One of the interesting things to notice in the healing, it's talked about in, very, in different ways each time, but Jesus rebukes the fever and it leaves her. He speaks to the fever and says, go. Just as when he delivers the demon-possessed boy, he rebukes the demon and says, be silent, come out. And just as when he calms the storm at sea, he rebukes the wind and the waves and says, be silent, and the storm ends. Now, that's a very kind of odd choice of language to talk about healing uh, a fever or stopping a storm or, well, a demon at least, that one we can see, be silent, you know, and be rebuked, that we can see. But these other two things are so odd. What is connecting? Because it's the same word in the Greek. <laughs> what is connecting these three kinds of miracles? In the first century, Nobody knew about bacteria. We had no microscopes. Nobody understood viruses. There was a, f the, the common understanding of that time was that behind the forces of nature, the wind, the snow, the sun, the rain, behind the demons who torment people and behind disease were supernatural, spiritual forces who were battling against humanity and battling against God. And when Jesus heals, he heals in the language and the understanding of his era, which is to rebuke the force behind each one of these things. Today we would say, oh, well, you know, we know that uh, the sun is just a big burning ball of, of fire and gas, as are the stars. And we don't think that there are forces of, of the spiritual world behind them. But, but that's not how it was in the first century. And what Jesus shows is that he is Lord of all. Don't go away. When we come back, Danny and I use the Bible as our guide to locate the house of Peter's mother-in-law. First Century Foundations is committed to helping those in Israel who are most in need. And this is possible because of people like you. Your donations are supporting the most vulnerable in the land, especially aging Holocaust survivors. By providing them with food and medication and spending quality time with them, First Century Foundations with our partner ministries are making a real difference in the lives of people who have experienced so much suffering. People like us who lost everything and live with the pain to have people that help us a little bit we're very grateful. Call or write today and receive our bi-monthly newsletter, including the Israel Prayer Watch, to help you pray for all the ministries we support in Israel. Partner with us for just $30 a month or more, and your generous donations can make a difference in Israel today.
So this is the entry into the synagogue, which right. was also elevated, and all the population lived around it. So this is the village, the community. Now, the Gospel of Mark indicates that the home of the mother-in-law of Peter was nearby because nearby. they immediately entered it. So they thought, well, maybe it's right here uh -huh. or right there. See, it was all excavated, and this area was home sweet home for some family. Right. But we didn't find a doormat. <laughs> Welcome to my house, the mother-in-law of Peter. We don't even know her name. <laughs> but we did find a very unusual stratigraphy. You know that word, stratigraphy, the way the site is layered? Yes. Over there. Okay. Let's have a closer look. All right. We made our way in the footsteps of Jesus across the town of Capernaum and toward a very unique church built directly over the location that has long been venerated as the home of Peter's mother-in-law. At first, it was a simple home, just like any other home around here. Right. Home sweet home for some poor fisherman family. But 300 years after the time of Jesus, that specific house was fenced off. You can see the foundations. I mean, this part of the wall is modern, but the lower level with the plaster yes. is from the fourth century. Okay. Someone marked it and framed it from the rest of the village. Mm -hmm. And another hundred years later, an octagonal church was built over it. Now, most of the time churches are basilica in shape, which means it's a place just to convene, to get together. Yes. Octagonal and round churches are built usually to mark something holy in the middle. Okay. It's a concentric building. The, the center, the focal point is in the middle. So the structure tells the story. The structure is indicating yeah. that they highly venerated something in the middle. Okay. It seems quite clear that this was believed to be the house of the mother-in-law of Peter, the place where Jesus healed her, perhaps performed wow. other miracles. Yeah. So it was marked. And Byzantine period uh, visitors that come here mark this building as the home of Peter, the prince of the disciples, is one of them labels. It. Okay. okay. Now, in the excavations, we also found uh, mosaic floors. Yes. Well, some part of it is still visible right there. Yes. Okay. And the centerpiece is uh, replicated next to the entry. And they did find here some graffitis uh, of Christian contents, like a cross, okay. Che Maria, Bless Maria, and so on. It means that people were worshiping this place maybe even before the fourth century. Okay. But it is right next to the synagogue. It, it does yeah. fit. Absolutely. Okay? And the Catholics who excavated the whole area were very excited, of course. This is a Try the grand reward, but they wanted to make this into a modern worshiping place without ruining the antiquities. What yes. is the creative solution? Yeah. Hence the building over top. Uh, a hovering church above it, like a spaceship. It's anchored on the sides, but it's not touching the antiquities here. Right. It's like floating over it. It has a glass bottom uh, floor, so you can see straight into the center of the house and uh, completed in 1990, it enables also modern worship at the same place. Yes. Wonderful. Okay, and notice that it's also octagonal. Right. They're kind of dialoguing with the ancient building. Mm -hmm. Well, let's go see the floor, the replica yes. of the mosaic floor. We made our way over to the mosaic floor, and I was surprised at the symbol chosen for the design. A peacock. A peacock with which, which feathers spread. Yeah. Isn't that surprising? It is. And I must say, to this day, I have not read a proper explanation. Everyone explains it is a peacock, but not why is there a peacock here? Some of the ancient visitors to Capernaum also indicate that this was not just the home of the mother-in-law of Peter, but of Peter himself, and maybe the place where Jesus lived. He had to live somewhere here. Maybe he's just joined them. Okay. And this might be the hint for this, because a peacock sometimes appears in Christian art and it represents Jesus himself. Why? Because first of all, it is the most beautiful male animal in the animal kingdom. Okay. And, but more important, the peacock sheds its feathers every year and they grow again, a symbol of ah, resurrection, resurrection, rebirth. Life. Yeah. So maybe they also argued, believed that this was the very place where Jesus stayed, where Jesus lived. Okay, and that's why this subject was chosen. Very interesting. 
The Very Catholics placed a, a sculpture right next to it, which presents Peter and in the more conventional way. Right. You see the keys, you see the fish, and he's also standing above a rock. Let's have a closer look at this. This definitely relates to the house and Peter's presence here. Okay. Although I must say, John says Peter was from Bethsaida, but he, he did live here. Apparently he married one of the girls of the town and that's why the mother-in-law is also here. And Jesus perhaps joins them in the family itself as the peacock suggests. Isaiah in chapter nine uh, talked about the fact that the one who would come, the Messiah who would come would, would uh, be in a place right. like this. In, in, the, the, in between the two plots of Zebulun and Nisascha, I think, okay? And this is indeed the transition between the province of the Galley and the, and the province where the Golan Heights are. Yes. Let me show you also the shoreline. Okay. Okay? This is from where he sailed also, and that is such a beautiful viewpoint. Well, I love coming to the Sea of Galilee. It is so beautiful. Yes, and the sea level now is exceptionally high. It's we, incredible, yeah. We had such a good winter. I've never seen the water this high. Yeah, me neither. At least for a long time. And, and what a beautiful, serene morning here Gorgeous. by the Sea of Galilee in the front of ancient Capernaum. Imagine fishermen living here, pulling out the nets and the boats and then fixing them, uh, checking out what's the, the catch of the day. Yeah. When a guy from Nazareth joins them and starts speaking about the, the, the end of days, the kingdom of heaven, recruiting the first disciples, yeah. it all happened here if only we could hear it. Incredible. Absolutely incredible. It's a beautiful yes. place. Okay, and you can see so many other sites that are mentioned in the New Testament. The Decapolis, one of the cities of the Decapolis Gosh. is right there. Yeah. The site identified with the swine miracle beneath it. Yes. Tiberius, Magdala, Gennesaret, uh, Peter Primacy Church, the multiplication of the loaves and fish. It's all around here. It's all around Capernaum. Yeah. This is where Christianity began. Amazing. Well, Danny, thank you so much for bringing us to Capernaum and teaching us about the other hometown of Jesus. And uh, we look forward to exploring many more things. My pleasure. My pleasure, too. Thank you for joining me today as we explored the town of Capernaum. Please join us again next week as we continue to get to know Jesus better right here in his homeland. Israel, that meaningful name is mentioned more than 2,300 times in the Bible. It is from this land, nation, and people that Christianity emerged some 2,000 years ago. But since that time, Christianity has become mostly disconnected from Israel, and without an understanding of the Jewishness of Jesus and our Hebraic foundations, so much of the depth and meaning of the Bible is lost. First Century Foundations is committed to helping Christians reconnect and stay connected to Israel. We invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel where you can view our TV programs and weekly video podcasts, Keeping It Israel. Follow us on Facebook and our other social media platforms. Let's reconnect to Israel and stay connected. Find out more at firstcenturyfoundations.com.